Did you know that June's room in the House of the Commander has a few reminders about her previous life? Which real person do you think was the prototype for Serena? And why did choosing the perfect red color become a real problem for the costume director? Hi, I am Clive, here on the Asa channel, and I have the answers to these and many other questions about the darkest TV show on our screens lately. The Commander and Serena's Age In the TV show, June and the wife of Commander Waterford, Serena, look as if they are the same age. But in the book, Serena was much older. Even though the author never indicated her precise age, the commander's wife is described as having arthritis and uses a cane. The actor Joseph Fiennes, who portrayed Commander Waterford, believes this subverts the audience's expectations. I think of Syria and one particular leader who looks like a very nice academic, he says. You would never attribute the horrors happening there to someone who looks like that. I love the complexity of wrong-footing the audience with someone's age and the way they look. It's hard to disagree with him. Looking at this beautiful married couple, it is impossible to guess what horrors are happening behind closed doors. Where is the series filmed? The events in the series take place in what used to be Boston, Massachusetts, but the actual filming took place in the suburbs of Toronto, which, as fans of the book and the show will know, is ironic since Toronto is where refugees from Gilead escape to. The locations used are roughly split into city and suburb, with the latter filmed in two small towns near Toronto. The town Hamilton is where we find the house where June is stationed with the commander and his wife. The wall by the water, where the handmaids pass hanged bodies, is real, and it is located in Cambridge, in Ontario. Coronation Park in Oakville was used to film scenes where the handmaids gather outside for different ceremonies. Elizabeth Moss is also a producer. The actress did not only portray the main character in the show, she was also the show's producer. It's a sh load more work. It's just constant, but it's so much more fulfilling as well, she says. I don't just show up, do my scene, and leave. If I'm not acting, I'm making calls. I'm watching cuts of episodes. According to Moss, working on this project made her a stronger person. Having to say my own ideas, having to go up against people, having to argue has definitely brought out, I think, a bit of a strength in me that I didn't know that I had, the actress said. Although the second season of the series came under fire from some fans for being too dark and hard to watch, Moss said that she feels the job gives her an outlet. Usually I say, you have to watch though, she said, because that's real. If you can't watch a TV show we're making about it, how are you going to be able to confront and look at what's actually happening around you in your country and this world? The Commander Stole Artwork for His Home Most of the events in the show, especially from season one, take place within just one location, in the Commander's house. Over the two seasons, we got so used to this place that we got to know the location of every room. But have you ever paid attention to the pictures on the walls? Serena is fond of painting and gardening, so it's no surprise that there are pastoral paintings hanging in her sitting room. Wait, that looks sort of familiar. Is that Monet? Yes, the commander's esteemed position allowed him to borrow a few paintings from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. As always, the devil is in the details. June's Bedroom As you remember, before creating Gilead, June worked as a book editor. But now, she, like other women, is not allowed to read and write. The showrunners decided to place a few reminders of her previous life in her room. We put a desk there, but she can't write, so it's almost like a remnant, a remembrance of, oh, I was a writer, an editor, I can't even sit and write anymore, production designer Julie Berghoff says. Besides, we can see an empty mirror frame on the wall. They don't want you to be vain anymore, so we basically put the shape of a mirror on the wall to make it feel like at one point there was a mirror there, Berghoff said. Moss says she noticed something else missing in the room. The most distinctive thing about Alfred's bedroom is that there are no locks on the doors, and there's nothing in there that you could hurt yourself with. So, that's a political message as far as women's rights, Moss says. The author of the book had an episodic role in the show. Beyond just adapting the novel, the series invited Margaret Atwood to be a part of the production process from the beginning, so she's had a hand in shaping the new version of the world. We wanted her to cameo in the first episode, and we knew she'd play an aunt. That's the only thing that made sense for her to play. And in that scene, I'm supposed to be slapped by an aunt, and so we were like, oh, how about Margaret Atwood? Moss told GQ. When Alfred hesitates to participate in the slut shaming, Atwood steps forward and hits the side of her head. The author confessed the scene was hard to film. Although it was only a television show and these were actresses who would be giggling at coffee break, and I myself was just pretending, I found this scene horribly upsetting, Atwood said. It was way too much, like way too much history. Alfred in the book versus Alfred in the series When the servants move to a new house, they get new names that are linked with a new master's name. Hence, Friend's handmaid is Alfred, Glenn's handmaid is Offglen, etc. Atwood never revealed Alfred's birth name in the book. Some astute readers suspected that June was Alfred's real name. 
When Alfred first arrives at the Red Center, she and the other women exchange names from bed to bed. Alma, Janine, Dolores, Moira, June. June is the only name on that list that is not connected with any other character in the book. Atwood has said of the theory, that was not my original thought, but it fits, so readers are welcome to it if they wish. It's also worth mentioning that unlike the rebellious June in the series, Alfred is a much more passive character in the book. When the government first outlaws jobs for women, she does not go outside to protest. When Offglen later asks Offred to spy on her commander, Offred decides not to. Her priority is to survive, not to rebel. Gilead is more diverse in the series. In the book, the government of Gilead separates people of different races, just like the Nazis. Non-white people were removed from society and resettled in the national homelands. But the TV version of The Handmaid's Tale has a more diverse cast of characters, including Alfred's friend, Moira, and Alfred's husband, Luke. Also, more characters in the show identify themselves as LGBTQ than in the book. While Moira, June's best friend, is openly gay in the book, June says she has to adjust to the news after Moira comes out. In the TV show, June is fine with her friend's sexuality. Bruce Miller, the producer, commented on such changes. What's the difference between making a TV show about racists and making a racist TV show where you don't hire any actors of color? Elizabeth Moss explained, We wanted the show to be very relatable. We wanted people to see themselves in it. If you're going to do that, you have to show all types of people. You have to reflect current society. This is the 10th adaptation of the book. Hard to believe, right? The stage version premiered at Tufts University just a few years after the book was published in 1985. There's also been an opera and even a ballet. It was also performed twice as a radio play and made into a movie in 1990. The movie had quite famous actors in it. Natasha Richardson as Alfred, Faye Dunaway as Serena Joy, Duvall as the Commander, and Elizabeth McGovern as Moira. However, despite such a cast, the film was not well received and had a messy production. Director Volker Schlondorf replaced original director Kala Rice admits internal bickering over a screenplay by Harold Pinter. The character Serena Joy Waterford has a prototype. In Season 2, we learn more about Serena Joy Waterford and her beginnings. She was a conservative activist who, along with her husband Fred, spearheaded the Puritan movement that ultimately gave rise to Gilead. According to the rumors, Serena was based on conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly, who established herself over many years as one of the fiercest anti-feminists and anti-abortion advocates in the USA. Schlafly also opposed the Equal Rights Amendment, which she considered an attack against traditional gender roles. Margaret Atwood is working on a follow-up. Rather soon, in September of this year, the author Margaret Atwood will release a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale called The Testaments. However, this book will not be connected to the show and will feature the testimonies of three female narrators from Gilead. It will be a so-called epilogue to the events of the first book, which ends very much in the way season one ends, with Alfred entering the van due to Nick's insistence. The Testaments will be set 15 years after Alfred's final scene in The Handmaid's Tale and narrated by three women. Dear readers, wrote Atwood in a press release announcing the book, everything you've ever asked me about Gilead and its inner workings is the inspiration for this book. Well, almost everything. The other inspiration is the world we've been living in. The Handmaid's Tale Season 3 Trailer The teaser trailer of Season 3, which the channel Hulu showed at the Super Bowl, was inspired by President Ronald Reagan's It's Morning Again in America commercial back from his re-election campaign in 1984. Actually, it even sounds like the narration being used in the spot is the exact same that Reagan himself read for his TV spot over 30 years ago. It's morning again in America, he says. Today, more women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. This year, dozens of children will be born to happy and healthy families. However, the teaser reveals that under the Gilead regime, it is the handmaids who produce children like some machines for men and women in power. It is a dark reminder of the dismal state of women's sexual and social rights in the Republic of Gilead. The Symbolism of the Colors It's hard not to pay attention to the colors of the clothes that Gilead's inhabitants wear. The red clothes of the servants that cover the body completely indicate the handmaid's fertility, echoing the color of menstrual blood. On the contrary, the wives wear blue clothes associated with the Virgin Mary, the Madonna, symbolizing their roles as mothers and also their belonging to the upper class. The aunts wear unremarkable brown clothes that makes us think of the Nazi uniforms. The Marthas, domestic servants running the homes, dress in green, a color associated with nature but also cleanliness and health. Different medical organizations frequently use green. According to Anne Crabtree, the costume designer, it was difficult to find the perfect red. We went through a million different shades of red, and we knew that it had to match any skin tone and be beautiful. From a beautiful porcelain white Lizzie Moss to a beautiful chocolate Samira Wiley. 
Crabtree also designed the iconic bonnets the handmaids wear, their wings, which fit snugly on the head, held in place with magnets against the gusts of wind in Toronto, where the show is filmed. The wardrobe she created specifically for the show is so popular and recognizable that it's become one of the most widespread choices for Halloween costumes and protest marches. What surprised you the most? Let us know in the comments! Would you like to find out more interesting details and Easter eggs about your favorite movies and TV shows? Subscribe to our new channel, Awesome Movies!